Happy Wednesday, third day of the week, also known as Hump Day, and it is today's Talk with Marty G, and I am Marty G, bringing you yet another edition of today's talk. It's been a little bit, it's been a while, I'm glad to be back with you, but I did bring a friend with me, I brought you Roger Devers. Hi, Roger, good to see you. Oh, it's amazing to be here, Marty, thank you. Thank you for being on, how you been? I've been very well, actually. Uh, this, this year... I think the biggest the biggest thing that I'm excited about is things starting to regain a sense of normalcy out, out in the world, uh, and that's exciting for me. So, I agree. You know, aside from uh, this incredible heat, <laughs> the, the, the normalcy has been weird. I actually walked into a place the other day, and I was like actually the only person with a mask on. I'm like, whoa, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, in <laughs> It, it's it's getting to the point where you know pretty soon it'll be weird walking into a bank with a mask on again. You know, I mean that's the, the criminals could have their their masks back. Right. <laughs> uh, it's funny you say that because that was like the first thing I did when the whole mask thing came out. I actually uh, live streamed myself walking into a Dairy Mart with a hoodie, sunglasses, and a mask. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and everyone was comfortable with you doing that. I was like, "This is cool." No, no yeah, one's stopping yeah. me. And and so yes, I've uh, you know very much. I, I'm a real people. I, I'm assuming like you, Marty. I'm I'm a real people person. I get I draw a lot of my energy from other people's energies. Um, and so while Zoom is awesome and technology is great. Uh, and I've re I'm really happy that I we had it during this pandemic. Um, I, I prefer meeting people in public. I prefer 100%. you know just sitting across from people and having other you know other people around. It just it just fills me up you know faster than anything else. Just having that that energy around me. So. Yeah, it's a it's a great communication channel, but by no means it is a replacement for live in person human contact. Definitely not. Now you're with Primerica, right? Yeah. Yep. Tell tell me a little bit about Primerica. Uh, so so what I do with Primerica, and there's if someone were to say Google Primerica, you're gonna okay. you're gonna have a range of information to choose from. Uh, you're going to see a lot of negative things that uh, relate to MLMs. Um, and th there's, this is really the only financial services company that, that has a part of their business plan, you know, uh, formatted like a MLM, uh, like a life insurance MLM, where you recruit people and, and then you get them to license and they sell life insurance and they get people licensed and you build a team and, and, and honestly, it could be very lucrative. Uh, I am not part of that situation. Uh, okay. I'm with the I'm with PFS Investments, Primerica Advisors, so we're full service um, investment advisors, and I specialize in uh, retirement, uh, and and by that I mean my sole focus when I when I meet with clients is is talking about retirement, uh, and that that means if you're 15 years old, you're opening up a, an account for 25 bucks a month, or you're 55 years old, and you're staring right down the barrel of retirement. Um, you know, it's all it's all about retirement. Every every right. big financial decision that that you make impacts your retirement, and so so that's why you know it, it, that's right now people's biggest concern. Now you were you were doing so you were doing financial long before you came to Primera. Right. How how long have you been doing this? Uh, I've been securities licensed uh, for thirty years. So uh, I started with my father back in oh geez, what was it ninety ninety one? Yeah. So so in the very early nineties when when I became licensed and, and started work, and it's you know so it's been I we have a huge amount of it's me and my brother in in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so between the two of us, we have about 63 years of experience in the market uh, and dealing with these things. So, so yes, and then about three years ago, 
um, three to four years ago, we, we made the move to Primerica because of regulatory changes uh, in, in the industry that force, were forcing me to charge my clients far more than I wanted to charge them at my old broker dealer. So we had to find, had to find an alternative. And, right. you know, luckily enough, you know, Primerica, uh, I was introduced to Primerica and, and really it's, uh, our val my values uh, are very aligned with this organization. Mm -hmm. um, from what we do, uh, they're, they're really designed to help Main Street America, uh, mm -hmm. not not just work with wealthy people, but right. because the, the big question is, you know, you go to some financial professionals and, and they have a minimum, you know, well, we really don't work with people that don't have under $250,000 of assets. And some are higher, some are lower as far as minimums. Um, but the, the big question that people have is, well, how do I get $250,000 right. or $100,000? You know, how do I, how do I start doing that? And, and that's really where Primerica fills that, that need out there. Because like I say, we, we talk to people about reducing debt and, in, and increasing their wealth. And we could do it for 25 bucks a month. 25 to 50 bucks is, is, is a, you know, generally the minimum. Where some people, you know, it's two hundred fifty dollars or a thousand dollars or X amount every month. So, so we feel like we can. I can work from somebody who has that that could, you know, barely has anything is is trying to build to someone who's got eight million dollars, right? And and they need someone to manage it. We we could we can absolutely uh, take care of any uh, client situation. So I'm curious, you know, we were talking a little bit, and you just mentioned a little bit, you know, regulatory, you know, made you kind of think about changes. And we were talking a little bit about this, this before we started. Uh, I have my own opinion about why regulatory clamped down on people, but you know, what, what happened? You know, things happened that made regula regulatory things just like clamp down on financial people. Yes. Can you just maybe just give an overview for this, the layman? What changed? What made everything just clamp down on you guys? Well, I mean, honestly, in in all you know, candor, it it was bad advisors. Uh, yeah. it, it, it it all came down to fees, and so there in in our world, people who sit behind the the advisor desk, the the holy grail of the investment world is is people retiring and moving money from a 401k or other retirement plans to an IRA. That is the biggest transfer that we're going to probably see, you know, for that individual client because, you know, they, they'll have worked for for a company and they'll have, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars in a in a in a 401k that now needs to go into an IRA. And what was happening is that they were going into these investments that they were charging exorbitant fees and the investment was charging. And, be, and before you know it, it, you know, the 15% was gone up front, you know, between the, the investment fees and the advisor fees and all these other fees. And so the regulatory element, it was um, from the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they changed the way that the game was, was played. You know, capping a lot of the you know, and and I I don't have a a problem with what was done. I mean, with the the intent behind what was done, but Absolutely. I knew at the time that it was going to make everyone's the cost of poker go up for everybody. You know, basically. absolutely. So a couple yeah. of bad apples just spoiled it for the whole bunch, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, it's like so that's why I hate. That's why I got out of sales. You know, you got a couple of bad salespeople. And you come in trying to help people. It's like, oh, you're a sales guy, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, and and so and it absolutely is the case. Now that being said, it it saved people a lot of money in that that one particular, but it, it cost people across the board a little bit more, whether they know it or not. I mean, right. a lot of fees, and that's one of the things that we we're really pushing, uh, as far as the regulations. To, to make 
all the fees that people pay transparent and, and understandable across the board, which they aren't. A lot of people, and I, and I talk to a lot of people who do their own investing, and they say, oh, we, we don't pay fees. And I have to say, yeah, you kind of do. I mean, every, every mutual fund that you're in has fees. All the platforms have maintenance fees. There, there's fees. They may not show you um, in bold print on a, on a statement, but th there are fees. And, you know, you can, you can reduce those fees depending on where you, you're invested. Um, and so that's... All our clients know exactly what they're paying as far as fees on an annual basis. And because we feel like that's, we have to justify what we do. Um, if someone can do the exact same thing for, for far less fees by themselves, then, you know, more power to them. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's a challenge knowing that there's 65,000 different things to choose from. Where are you going to go? Right. And, and that's, that is, some people are very, very methodical and, you know, do a lot of their own research and that's what they enjoy doing, then absolutely, it's, it's, it's entirely possible. But I always caution that, understand what the fees are and know that they're not, if they're not shown, you know, because fees are a big, a big driving force. Um, we, we don't, I don't like to, um, and this is going to sound like an investment advisor here. I don't like to focus on the fees because to me, that's not the, the most important because fees are only really critical in the absence of value. You know, if, if you love this one particular bread, but it has to be flown in from France, you and so you have to pay $12 for this loaf of bread. Mm hmm but it's a, you know, you love it and it's a great, and, and you, you, that's value. You're willing to pay for that. Now, if you had to pay $12 for a loaf of Wonder Bread and you're, you're going to feel like you were ripped off because it's like, this is not my fancy bread. And, and I just, I'm not getting that value. So I don't want to make it seem that, the fees are the most important thing because really the the essence is what how are we doing are, are these are, are we making money that's the the main thing and are we making money decade by decade and you know knowing that there's always going to be negative market things Absolutely. that happen and and values are going to decrease from time to time that that's actually important mm -hmm. uh, as far as growth we really can't have growth without from time to time retreating and right so well and so anyway, that's, on, that's that's my take on that thank you and you know you touched on something earlier you know you said if people were to google my america and you know the negative things that are out there and being transparent you know i tell people a lot you know the, the one thing that i i thought once you know i'm old enough to remember when al gore invented the internet or he said he did you know i, <laughs> right. I always laugh at that but i always remember when that first uh, came down it's like uh, this is going to be the the nightmare of our society because now everybody with access has an opinion and that's really where we are today <laughs> if you don't know nothing's vetted everybody has an opinion i always say you know find out for yourself yeah you know and, get with it and, and do the research right and, and the one thing i do recognize with you is just your your passion you know your, uh, you know, your, your passion and transparency right you know what what else are you passionate about Oh, um, I, I mean, I think the biggest, by far right now, the biggest passion in my life is talking to people about mental health. Um, you know, that's even, you know, I, I, I think that, that I was just built and put here to serve. I mean, I, I love serving people. And I, I think that's why with my profession and helping people retire, I, you know, it just, you know, it makes me feel complete. Um, but also, uh, for 40 years, I've been dealing with pretty se severe depression. And it runs in my family. Uh, I, I joke all the time, you know, my family tree is, is you know, you half this lush green with fruit everywhere and, and, you know, amazing. The other half is dead with buzzards and, you know. It's and and so my father's side is 
riddled with with depression. Um, mm -hmm. There was going back four or five generations. We've had three suicides. There's been multiple uh, uh, institutionalizations. There's just been a lot of people dealing with with mental illness on my father's side. Uh, mom's side, not so not so much. Um, uh, it's it's you know very few people, mm -hmm. and so it's very interesting. And and I I feel like uh, where I mean it sucks, but I feel good that no one else in my immediate family is dealing with it, yeah. uh, okay. which makes me happy. Um, How, when did you find out that you were struggling with it? And when did it first uh, demonstrate in you? When did it first uh, you know, show up? When did you first start realizing, well, boy, yeah, I got it. Yeah, so it was, it was when I was the, the summer of my 13th year. So I was 13 years old and it just, you know, it, I, I see, like some people, it's, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I actually see my depression um, and I saw it there. It was like this, this floating thing and it, 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 you know, floated towards me and I was like stuck in, in, I couldn't move and couldn't run away. It's like one of those dreams where you're just, you see this thing and you, you know, your, your feet are in quicksand and you just can't move and you're just, it, it, you know, it's what it was. It was a situation like that, but it was. I was 13, and I didn't know what to do about it. It was just the weirdest thing. Um, but something happened there. Uh, the you know be, beyond that, uh, there was a, the family dynamic at that time was. You know, I came from a very loving, nurturing family that did everything they could for me, um, but. We also had, uh, I also was living with an uncle who was going through, you know, it was a bipolar manic depressant who mm. would go off his meds whenever he was feeling good. Yeah, uh, he, he would, he was a, a army veteran. So he would go to the VA and he would get his dosages all squared away. And then he'd come home and feel great and decide that he's cured and, and then go off and 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 at the time this was happening he was a, a pretty big challenge for my parents uh he was going through one of his his off times and it was just causing some you know some family situations so so i made a decision to at that time to not say anything to anybody about okay. it and and i always tell people it's like that was probably the best decision I made and the worst decision I've ever right. made because I, it's for, it forced me to have to deal with it myself. All right. So let me ask you a question. So this is something I, I always think is interesting because I, I myself diagnose chronic major depressive disorder. People get it very confused because uh, you, like I, were very approachable. We're happy people. When people would come up to us and think, well, how can you, you don't seem that way. So how would you explain to people that, um, you know, well, you don't look depressed. <laughs> right. And, and so I, I, I make a, uh, an argument and, and some people, you know, buy it and some people don't. It, it's, it's my opinion. There, there, there's a thing that it's psychological um, uh, situation. It's called Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Okay. And it's, and so basically what it says is, is this is what a person needs to be happy. Um, and it starts, it's a pyramid shape. At the bottom is your basic needs, uh, shelter, food, water, um, heat, you know, the, the basic survival things. And, and then it goes up to now you need a little bit better house, a little bit more uh, stability. You need maybe some, throw a friend or two in there and, and so it goes up till, till the very top is someone who, who needs to be respected, have power, have position of authority, those kind of things. And everyone falls somewhere on that hierarchy of, of what do you need to be happy? Mm -hmm. And so, so what I tell people is like, yes, I'm, I deal with depression all the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm a very happy person. I have a high life satisfaction. And, and 
that doesn't mean I'm happy and depressed at the same time. It means when I'm going through my depression, I'm feeling depressed. But I'm able to control it to such a degree that that I have a life, that I, you know, I have a business, that I'm able to, you know, I go on trips, I can I can do things, and and those things give me satisfaction. I can I can, so so on that hierarchy, I'm meeting the needs of of the things that I need to to be happy, um, and so so yes, uh, I feel like I have. I have reached that level, and I feel very satisfied with where I'm at, um, and and that's what a person needs to to technically uh, achieve happiness. Now, that doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. That doesn't mean right. that you, you you don't have the depression um, impact your life. It's just you know, I I I feel like you know. I, you can achieve and still be, you know, while you're being depressed, but in, in, in the bigger picture, your, your life means something to you. Okay. And you've also shared this in, like, you're an accomplished author now. So, right, let's talk about the book. Yes, yeah. So, so I um, wrote a book, uh, which, um, so, uh, da, 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 da. okay. All right, I'll I'll just talk and you can do your yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll I'll get it up here in a second. So 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 what what precipitated the book was uh, last summer. You know, in the in the height of the pandemic and when everything was, you know, falling apart. Uh, I I had uh, my first bout of PTSD. Um, and what people probably most people don't really know about me so much is. Uh, I have two two autistic kids, and one of my one of them is severely autistic, and uh, he's he's a big dude. He's like six foot three and weighs three hundred pounds. And I mean, he he when he got when he got violent, I mean, to this day, if you go to my house, there's not a lot of stuff hanging on the walls. There's not. A, I mean, if if it was breakable, it got broken. Um, right. And so now he's been doing very well um hasn't had too many outbursts we we, we have him you know he's on uh, some medications that help curb his his um violent tendencies mm -hmm. and so uh but g last summer i was having issues with my plumbing and i was trying to fix that and and he i thought he was gonna have a, an outburst and it just triggered this this response in me that, I mean, I, I literally thought I was dying. Um, I, I thought that was it. And, and my heart was palpitating. I was flushed, sweating profusely. Um, and that led to some severe depression uh, and what we, we look at mental setback. Uh, and so the, the book came out through that. So through my recovery from that process is is really, I, w I was journaling, I was writing down, which I usually don't do, um, but this was again my therapy, my you know it was therapeutic for me. So I was writing down what was going on, what my experience with different things have been, and and so that that was the book. I, I did not write it to 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 have it published. I mean. I wrote it so so people understood kind of what I was going through, but I mean, it was it was an exercise of therapy for me. Um, and the last thing that you know, so I, I got through it. I got I I edited it myself. I put it out, you know, and I said the last thing I need to do for closure is just to send it to somebody and say, would they, you know, would it, could it possibly be published? And, and it was more to have it out there to try to help other people um, than to be like, oh, I'm a published author kind of thing. It was a closure situation. So I, I sent it to one company and they basically said that if we, you don't hear anything in four to six months, then consider that we've passed on it. And I'm like, I, I'm waiting on my closure. I need... 
<laughs> I don't want to wait four to six months just to be told, yeah, we're not going to, you know, we're, you know, passing on it, whatever. I so so I saw another, like everything else, once you, once you look at an ad for something or click on it, you get a bunch more of these. So, uh -huh. so Newman Springs approached me and they said, you know, their, their pitch was, you know, submit the book. We'll let you know within a week. Um, and I'm like, well, pff, th th there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, so I submitted it to them. It was four, four or five days later, they called me and said, we want to publish your book. And away we went. It took, oh, I mean, it took six, seven months in, in total with all, with everything that, that had to be done with every stage. Um, but yeah, that's what, and in the meantime, the, the initial company who I submitted to came back and said, we wanted to publish your book. So, <laughs> so it was, it was an interesting dilemma. And of course I went with who, who offered me it first. Um, right. And uh, it was a very, I mean, it, it was a process that taught me everything that goes into making a book. So it, I, I fully appreciate um, now when I see books out there that, you know, all the work that's gone into them. So, yeah, that, so that's the story behind the, the book and where it came from. And it was born out of the, the pandemic, but more than that, it was just, um, I think what I try to tell people is, look, I've been dealing with it for, for 40 years and it almost got me. I mean, I, there's never a time when you can say, oh, well, I got it handled now. Um, the, that, that doesn't exist. It's something that, that you, you need to work on and be ready to, to you know, uh, repel at any moment, no matter, no matter how old and no matter how much experience you have with it. Right. Right. And I think what's great, I mean, at least for me, I have someone local that I can uh, tap for, uh, for tips when I try to publish mine. So thank you for being available yeah. for that. So No, absolutely. You know, so, uh, you know, I don't want to take too much more of your time, and I do appreciate you being on. Um, any parting thoughts or anything you want to share, you know, before we get on the road? I mean, I really want to get a copy of the book. I was hoping to be able to read it before. I'm going to try to pick up a, a copy of it. But anything you want to share, uh, share with us before we go? No, I, you know, I, I really, I just appreciate the, the opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I, I find it, just critical for people to talk. I mean, you, you, you know, the power of talking, um, you know, you're, you're very easy to talk to. Uh, and, and I, I just, you know, it's, we're not going to get anywhere with where we're at until we get rid of the stigma associated with mental illness. I think people who deal with mental illness and, and live their lives, I think they're, they're some of the strongest people, most resilient people out there. Um, it's not the other way around, you know, and I think there's this, there's this stigma saying that something's broken, something's wrong, and nobody wants to admit that or accept that. And it, and it, that whole vision needs to change because it's, it's not the, the case. It's not, you know, the way that it is. People are struggling. Um, if, if they were able to, to say, hey, this is my problem. This is what I'm dealing with. This is who I am. And if everyone did that, I think that that there would be greater acceptance across the board and people would feel supported and, and be able to get the help they need before crisis happens. I think it's, it, you know, there's nothing out there. People don't want to talk about it. And then all of a sudden they're in crisis and now, now we have to talk about it. So, so that's what I would say is, is just, I encourage everyone to, to stand up and tell people who they are and, and join with others who have dealt with that and, and just talk, just keep awesome. talking. Awesome. Now, if they want to get a copy of the book, I've, I've got some information here, I believe. Uh, let's see, where is it? This popped it up and it disappeared again. It is right here, I think. There it is. They can go to yeah. So this here. Wait, this one. Wait, this one. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> Technology is great when it works the way I want it to. <laughs> there it is. 
Yeah. So, so it's, it's on iTunes, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, um, or there's a QR code if someone could scan that. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm doing a, a book signing at uh, the Palace Bakery and uh, Coffee Shop. It used to be Full City. It may still be Full City. I know they're changing it to Palace. Okay. Um, and that's going to be on the 10th of July, and I'll be okay. there from 10 to 3. So okay. um, I'll put that in the comments as well, just to make sure people know when to be there. I'll make sure I promote that a little bit for you too. Okay. Um, now, it's especially, uh, so that's for the book, but if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you for, obviously, for their financial future? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, the, the best way is, is just to, to uh, give me a call. Um, okay. And, and I, I'm, I think the, the best, because again, we, my, my email, my, my website is still waiting to be approved by my <laughs> compliance department. And so I would say, you know, you can contact me through that, but I think reaching out uh, 541-206-8406 okay. is, is the, still the best way to, to reach me. Uh, leave me a message if I don't answer. Uh, I'll get right back to you and we'll get something set up. Fabulous. Well, Roger, I definitely appreciate you and taking the time to sit down with me. I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. We'll get together in person here. I know real soon. I, I'm, I'm always going to see you. Greeters always, you know, at least online and when we get back together in person. But for now, uh, I think that's what we got. So thanks all right, for my friend. Your time with me. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Say goodbye. All right. See you later. Idea. Game with the what's that? Left out with the who she? Land game like 2D. I've been kicking like Bruce Lee. Okay. Margarita to the brim tip. Black denim need a slim fit. Yeah. Same people that I flex with be the ones that I'm in the gym with. I'm a living legend. You a dead cause and I'm dead. No, I'm dead, right? Leave it early, but I'm here night. Long and short to keep the head right. Teed up out in Malibu. Got sand all in my good shoes. Press a with the pessimism, but I only came for the good news. I am the show that they came for. Hitting the target I aim for. We've been discussing the contract. Just telling they get what they paid for. I am not with poverty. Really, it started to bother me. I need the yacht with the property. They come with the view that you gotta see. Came up from the basement. Hit the rooftop with a passion. Bad with some good credit. In a good sense for the fashion Dope blowing with the left hand Gripping with the right hand Over share to the airport I'ma hit you back with my flight Feel land I'm in the move for a switch up I hit the function, hit the rose Till I hiccup